Here's a shot I took of Fred McMurray just recently. This was taken five years ago on the set of The Mating Game with Debbie Reynolds and her new baby. Go to sleep, my little honey. Mommy has to make some money. Here's a shot I took 10 years ago on location with Tyrone Power and Linda Donnell. This was taken 20 years ago at an Academy Award dinner. Norma Shearer, Herbert Marshall, and Clark Gable. And here's a picture I took over 30 years ago at a party when I first arrived in Hollywood. The two greatest, Laurel and Hardy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The film you're about to see is not intended to be an epical history of Hollywood. It is not a rehash saga of the movies. It is merely a day-by-day -day personal film diary of pictures that I assure you you've never seen before and probably will never see again. Actually, this show has no deeper purpose than to call back pleasant memories of a lively group of people who worked hard and played hard in developing a great industry. Recently, we had a preview of this show, and one TV columnist summed it up this way. He said, everybody over to Ken Murray's house for home movies. Well, I read someplace that amateur photographers are America's largest hobby group, and I must say that they're very well represented in this town. You can see this show has a very expensive camera crew. I have no idea how Cary Grant or any of the others were bitten by the camera bug, but with me it was very simple. I merely started taking home movies out here to send back to the folks. At first, as an obscure, vaudeville actor, taking sightseeing buses through studios and trying to stand in front of newsreel cameramen at premieres. Of course, later on, when I got my first part in a movie at Paramount, opposite Helen Twelve Trees, a long-forgotten little opus appropriately entitled Disgraced. Get a load of that leading man. There's a method actor with no method. But there was some compensation. I did get some great pictures around that time. Here's a shot taken over 30 years ago on the Paramount Studio Street. For you Hennessy fans, that's Jackie Cooper when he played Skippy. up for a little publicity stunt with Groucho and Harpo Marx. That pretty starter is Carol Lombard. You know, life around the studio seemed a lot more fun in the early 30s. Can you imagine Wall Street standing for a caper like this today? You know who Jackie is waving at? Nick Lucas. He came over to have lunch with me. That fellow at the finish line is Charles Lawton. Hoppo really gave Jackie a bad time. Yes, there was a spirit of gaiety and excitement on the lot that day. I don't know why that guy's spending so much time on his nose when it's the mouth that needs the attention. Joey Brown was making his first talkie. And so was Cecil B. DeMille. I think this was Cleopatra starring Clutter Coba. Here's a nice guy, Johnny Weissman. He was making a date for a premiere that night. Everyone on the lot was talking about that opening. It was a new picture called She Done Him Wrong. And no one was more excited than this young man. He was playing the male lead opposite Paramount's newest sensation, Mae West. The voluptuous blonde with the swaying hips and the pungent quotes. This was a big night for May. She thanked Sid Groman for the use of the theater and hoped everyone would like her new picture. If you watch very closely, you can almost hear her say, why don't you come up and see me sometime? May could well be proud of this moment. The whole town turned out to pay her homage. There's the king of Hollywood, 
Douglas Fairbanks Sr. And wherever you saw the king, you were bound to see the queen, Mary Pickford, with Luella Parson. Clark Gable with Rhea Gable, and Ruth Eddy. Carol Lombard and a group of friends. Walter Houston. There he is with Jack Dempsey and Max Baer. There's Russ Colombo with the beautiful Sally Blaine. She's Loretta Young's sister. Looks like Weissmuller got his date. Loopy Valet. All right, so I'm a bad photographer. I cut off his head. And of course, George Raft was there. Mae West made her first picture with him. The master of ceremonies was a very young Dick Powell. I've taken a lot of pictures of Dick through the years. I was there when he took his first plunge at his new home in Toluca Lake. I remember when he got his first car, his first baby, and his first suit with a belt in the back. And I was with him when he caught his first marlin off Catalina Island. This was a very enjoyable trip. Weather great, fishing excellent. That's the bait. That's the size I usually bring home. Man, that's fast action. Dick's got a strike. Keep the line taut, Dick. Don't give him any slack. These are always anxious moments when they dance on their tail, trying to throw the hook. This was a dandy, over 200 pounds. Boy, the chances a happy fisherman will take when he's excited. Yes, in the early 30s, Catalina was the place to fish, and Malibu was the place to own a beach house. It was a badge of rank to be a member of this colony, well worth the 25-mile drive to and from work every day. It was Shantytown Deluxe, where each shanty cost thousands of dollars. That's Arthur Lake, one of my first friends in Hollywood. You know, digging up old pictures like this can be quite a discouraging shock to your ego. I'd always sort of remembered myself as looking like this fellow in a bathing suit. Well, maybe not exactly. That's Joel McRae. And certainly not like this fellow. That's Buddy Rogers. Here's a couple more Malibu Beach combers. John Bowles, Buster Collier, and Robert Wolseley. As time went on, in addition to Malibu, many of the stars built big homes further down the beach. That's Cary Grant's. Sounds like Cary's having a party. Often that you can catch this guy napping. And here's another rare shot. Nowadays, you very seldom see a picture of Gertrude Lawrence, a charming girl. In the same group, Gregory Ratzel and the beautiful Claire Windsor. How would you like to have this lovely young lady for a neighbor? That's Norma Shearer. She just dropped in from next door. And Irene Dunn came right from the studio. Here is another picture of the host, but this was taken a long ways from the beach. This was on location at Lone Pine, California for a picture called Gunga Din. Man, I never saw so much action. That young man is the director, George Stevens. 
Victor McLaughlin was in that picture. No doubt about this being a home movie, Vic is sure out of character. And there's the fellow who played the title role, Gunga Din. He's one of the finest character actors on the screen, Sam Jaffe. Today, you TV watchers know him as Dr. Zorba. When this picture was taken, Ben Casey was eight years old. Cary Grant tells a very funny story about working with this elephant. Her name was Annie, and he said he spent so much time with her and she became so attached to him that every night she would trumpet and bellow and carry on, keeping the whole company awake until he went over and slept beside her. That Annie had a pretty good technique, using Cary Grant for a tranquilizer. Beautiful country up there at Lone Pine. I didn't take these shots. They were taken by Grant himself. You'd never guess who's holding that snake. Another star out of Gunga Din. Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Nice shot. I think that Grant is a little more artistic than I am. And here's another artistic photographer, Lou Ayers. He has quite a collection himself. The reason he was so amused when I was taking this picture recently is that he was kidding me about the first shot he ever took of me with his camera. There it is. Portrait of an early American hot rod. Don't laugh. Beneath that pile of tin, there throbs a Model T. Of course, it doesn't throb unless you give it artificial respiration. We took a ride up Hollywood Boulevard that day. This is the way it looked in the early 30s. There's the old Hollywood Hotel at Hollywood and Highland. And there's the number one citizen of Beverly Hills, Mary Pickford. Most of the big stars lived in the hills of Beverly. Here's the home of the most dynamic redhead ever to streak across the Hollywood sky, Clara Bow. And there's the it girl with her husband, Rex Bell, right after they were married. I like Adolf Zucker's description of Clara Bow. He said, she danced even when her feet were not moving. Some part of her was always in motion, if only her big rolling eyes. Here's what happens when you have a little film left on the roll. That's a very young Lou Ayres making like Tarzan. Only in home movies could you catch Lou in a mood like this. Actually, he's always been a very serious young man. It's interesting to note that Lou Ayers got started in movies playing opposite Hollywood's biggest star. This was the first day on the set. And the star, Greta Garbo. Naturally, I didn't take these pictures. These are from Lou's own collection. The movie was called The Kiss, and it was the last silent picture made at MGM. The set was completely enclosed, and a violin and organ were playing the music you are now hearing. Lou said he will never forget this day. This was the first scene they shot, and to add to the tension, just before he went on the set, he was informed that a very nervous director had three other young actors standing by, just in case. At this moment, Lou Ayres was 19 years old, Greta Garbo, 22. When you've collected home movies for over 30 years, you naturally accumulate an awful lot of pictures. I'd moved around a lot in the last three decades, so locating and looking at miles of film for interesting shots was a king-size scavenger hunt. It's like rummaging through an old attic. You turn up a lot of junk, but occasionally, if you're lucky, you may find a rare masterpiece. And I think I did. It was a long-forgotten can of film. Lifting the lid was almost like opening King Tut's tomb. For inside were pictures which no one had ever seen before, home movies taken years ago within the confines of the largest, costliest, and most imposing private estate on the North American continent, San Simeon, the fabled citadel of William Randolph Hearst. Located a little over 200 miles up the Pacific coast from Hollywood on a high peak of the Santa Lucia Mountains. This past summer, I revisited San Simeon. The last time I was here was by invitation. 
But today, it's open house for everyone in the world. I paid my admission fee and was one of the 2,000 tourists that day who took the five-mile bus trip up the Enchanted Hill. This castle opened Christmas Eve, 1925, was the focal point of the giant Hearst Ranch, at that time spreading over 300,000 acres, nearly half the size of the state of Rhode Island. La Casa Grande, housing the largest private collection of art objects in the world, valued at over $50 million. Mr. Hurst called it his little hideaway. Last time I saw this pool, those beautiful marble columns from Italy had just been uncrated and put in place. I slipped away from the tour for a moment to see if there were any changes in the guest houses. No, my little bungalow was still there. Imagine me sleeping in Cardinal Richelieu's bed. Today, San Simeon is a state monument. But during its heyday, which spanned the roaring 20s and the fabulous 30s, it was the gathering place of the Hollywood immortal. With guests like Marie Dressler, seen here clowning with the host, William Randolph Hearst. That outfit she's wearing looks like a flea-bitten version of Touch a Mink. That pretty blonde over there with the short bobbed hair is Marion Davies. Although she typified glamour on the screen, at San Simeon she joined in the fun. Marion Davies was one of the best liked members of the motion picture colony. Beloved by everyone who knew her, she endowed many charities still in existence. That's Charlie Chapman kidding around.